Hello, everybody. Welcome to a Thoughts by Jay segment. This is obviously different than my This Week in U.S. Politics show. This is so I do not interrupt those shows that are happening on a regular basis during the week. I st- but I still want to put out content. I will try to do some recordings like this on a more frequent basis, but today's topic from Sargon of Akkad's This Week in Stupid, dated 29th of July 2018, really caught my attention. And caused me to want to put out this, um, caused me to want to put out this um, video. So, in his this weekend um, stupid video that he put out yesterday, the 29th of July, it's about a BBC article that is entitled Online Trolls May Be Barred from Being MP or Counselor, specifically meaning in the UK. Now, I know the UK doesn't have a constitutional First Amendment like we do here in the United States for free speech, but this is honestly just stupid. Just like here in the United States where we have two parties, I think they have three, is what Sargon said, three main parties that they have. It is absolutely idiotic to not allow public discourse, not allow public discussion about different ideas. Not everybody can be lumped into two or three or even four groups of um, groups of ideological think, you know. Sargon's a classic liberal. He says so himself all the time. I, I lean that way myself. But I can find many times where I can agree with a, a, progress, a progressive, not a regressive, leftist. I can also find myself agreeing with libertarians and you know, con- classic conservatives, or even, you know, whatever. But as I, re- as I listened to him talk about this, and as I read the article, I just can't help believe it, at how stupid this truly is. So you got Diane Abbott and Boris Johnson... Both received high levels of online abuse during the 2017 election. I don't know that I could call that abuse. Having a direct link with your constituents and the public via Twitter, via whatever social media, doesn't necessarily mean that negative comments or concerns raised by your constituents is abuse. I mean, seriously, come on. How could you even consider that? Online trolls who intimidate election candidates or campaigners could be barred from public office under government proposals being considered. Now, again, this is just a proposal, not a, uh, not actually in law yet, not on the records yet that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm going to read the whole article, but as you can see right here, there is a report which I do have, and I will share it, um, and I'll Um, link it. I'll put a link to it in the description. Extreme intimidation cases are already punishable with jail sentences. Duh. You can, you can see things even as much as Count Dinkula's comedic attempt at, you know, the Nazi pug, which I understood the point he was going for. He, you, you know who Count Dinkula is, you know, he's a comedian. You know that. But I also know that when people abuse Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. on or in the UK, they are punishable by jail sentences. So, a 2017 parliamentary report highlighted the, quote, significant factor, end quote, of social media abuse of candidates in the that year's general election. Constitution Minister Chloe Smith said intimidation was putting talented people off of standing for election. I should say, quote, talented people, end quote, off of election, of standing for election. She added that the measures being considered would, quote, protect voters, candidates, and campaigners so they can make their choice at the ballot box or stand for public service without fear of being victims of misinformation or abuse, end quote. 
I I understand that there are those out there that are trolls that are, our sole purpose is just to try and get laughs or mess with people. Some of them go too far and actually threaten people. But a lot of what people call as abuse these days on Twitter is oftentimes just criticism of a of a thought or an idea that a person puts out. I I would be remiss if I didn't study... Oh, I am remiss, actually, because I haven't been studying as much of my political... Um, my political people here in the U.S., specifically my congressman, Denny Hack, my senator, Maria Cantwell, both of whom are up for re-election this year. Um, I haven't gone through and looked at their their voting history. I haven't seen what they've done so far in Congress the last two years, or in the case of Maria Cantwell, the last six years. But if I found that there was something they didn't do or something they did that I didn't agree with, I would wholeheartedly expect that if they're on Twitter, that that is a way that I can contact them and air my grievance. There are other ways I could do that. I could go to their political webpage, you know, their actual their actual online presence of a website and contact their offices and even request meetings with them. You know, I could go to town halls and things like that. But just because I air those grievances on Twitter, on their Facebook page, on their re-election pages, etc., doesn't mean that it's not, doesn't mean that I'm trolling. It just means that I'm airing grievances. If I constantly repeat and spam those messages, I could see that as harassment, but not abuse. The length of the ban on convicted abusers stands, standing for standing for or holding public offices would be part of the consultation, a cabinet spokeswoman said. I don't even know what these links are to. Other articles, it looks like. MPs are being advised to quit Twitter. MPs call for misogyny to be hate crime. So basically, if you're a man and you you say something about a female MP, whether true or not, and they declare misogyny, you can be filed for a hate crime. I, that's stupid. Outline, outlaw online abuse, Katie Price tells MPs. A joint analysis, um, and those are just links to other articles, by the way. A joint analysis of tweets in the run in the run-up to the election of 2017 by the University of Sheffield and BuzzFeed News. Ooh, BuzzFeed News. Found that male conservative candidates received the highest percentage of abuse on Twitter. Amnesty International carried out a separate analysis of accounts of 177 female MPs in six months leading up to the elections and found that Labour's Diane Abbott received almost half at 45.1% of all abusive tweets that were sent to female MPs. Now, I have no clue about Diane Abbott's policies. I'm not familiar with the UK political sphere. So you might be asking yourself, why am I discussing this? The point is, is that if it's going to happen in the UK, eventually, even with our First Amendment, we could we could become complacent and allow Congress to erode our free speech. We could allow them to start telling us that things are abusive, things are, you know, hate speech, etc., that are illegal. Just because you said, you know, you didn't like that color of a dress on a woman, or you didn't like that way the man was wearing his suit, etc., because he was, you know, heavyweight, you know, heavy set, etc. There are, there are things that are just criticism that are not abuse and not meant as abuse. They're not meant as harassment. They're just honest comments, honest feedback. But people can't understand that. Analysis by the BBC political correspondent Alex Forth, Forth, I can't speak today, Forsyth. In reality, this may not prevent swaths of people from standing for office who otherwise would have. There are existing rules which stop those convicted of crimes from carrying 
a certain sentence from standing as an MP or local councillor. In addition, the vetting process for political parties should, in theory, at least stop unsuitable candidates from being selected. But there has been pressure from ministers to do something to tackle online trolls who target people in public office. After last year's general election, several MPs reported some of the worst abuse and harassment they had experienced. There's even a debate in Parliament during which men and women from all political parties recounted their experiences of sexist and racist comments, graphic language, and even death threats. Okay, this last paragraph, where they're talking about sexist and racist comments. That is harassment. I, I can understand that. Graphic language, like just swearing at people, calling them an effing idiot, or an effing cunt, or whatever you want to use, that's not harassment. That's not abuse. That's just somebody using, oh, how do they put it in Star Trek for? Colorful metaphors? But the point is, even I draw the line at death threats. I know of, of, I know that there are studies out there that show that the large majority of death threats online are are not, uh, how do I want to put it, not valid. But I, I personally take anybody who threatens me with a death threat seriously, or anybody who threatened my family seriously, or anybody who threatened one of my friends as a serious threat. It's not. It's not a humorous thing, you know. This is this is why, going back to the Count Dankula thing with his pug, with his girlfriend's pug. I have trained dogs, and I understand that they're that they respond to certain reward triggers. Mo most often than not, it's food. So, they may not understand what you were saying. You know, like when Count Dinkula said, gas the Jews, and the dog perked up. Because the dog was like, oh, I heard a phrase that sounds familiar to me. I better perk up. So that way, if I do, I can get a reward. You know, that's how it works. So I understood the comedic effect he was going for. Do I agree with it in taste? No. But I understood the comedic the comedic point counting that was going for. But I don't even think he would go as far as, you know, trolling an MP and th sending death threats. I don't know his Twitter account. I'd... But from what I have heard from people who actually know him and from what I have been able to gather, because I haven't gone through his whole history on online yet, it is... He doesn't seem like that kind of person. Yeah, he may, he has a different sense of humor than other people. Fine. I don't think you should go to jail for that. I don't even think you should be fined for that. But it is... It is what it is. Um, no doubt the government is keen to be taken serious. Keen to be seen taking this seriously. Currently, to stand in a general election, you must be at least 18 years old and either a British citizen, a citizen of the Republic of Ireland, or an eligible Commonwealth citizen. Certain people are disqualified from be from becoming an MP, be including certain people are disqualified from becoming an MP, including civil servants, members of police forces, members of the armed forces, judges, a person who has been convicted of an offense and has been detained for more than one year, peers who can sit in the House of Lords, bishops of the Church of England who are entitled to sit in the House of Lords, and someone currently subject to bankruptcy restriction orders. Okay. And that's the end of the article there. And so, this, this, is, this is rather interesting. The way I read this, and I, I'm I'm not a legal expert, and I don't know for certain. If you are in the UK, please tell me if this is true or not. If I moved to England and became a natural, and you know, became a citizen, like changed my residency, you know, devoted myself to the to them, to them, 
It sounds like I could possibly become an MP as long as I didn't, you know, do any of those things. And obviously I can't become a, ho a member of the House of Lords unless I married into a family. And even then I don't think I could. But that's not, neither here nor there. I just, honestly, from the way this article is written, it, it just, it, it's made to make it seem like, you know, people that have joined UKIP recently, um, Sargon of Akkad, Count Dinkula, um, I can't think of the third person that's more commonly, most commonly associated with it. Um, it goes by three names and I can't think of it all of a sudden. <laughs> Anyways, I just rambling on here a little too much, but I just I, I think that this is meant as a as a targeted attack against them, saying that these men don't deserve um, the attention that they're getting from society, and that they should not be allowed to use their position on YouTube to promote or social media in general to become elected officials. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into this study because it is 88 pages long. But the study is entitled Intimidation in Public Re Life, a review by the Committee on Standards of Public Life. Now, they start this off with the actual... Um, what is it with studies and having to waste pages? <laughs> they started off with the seven principles of public life. And Sargon went over this in his um, in his video. And I'm not going to try and go over it too much more. But holders of public office should be self should act solemnly in terms of public interest, i.e., selflessness. They should have integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. Here's my thing about this. And, uh, Holders of public office should be truthful. Now, just going over these, when I listened to Sargon yesterday, and when I and when I went back and reread this, a lot of these are really the, just the same thing, in my opinion. Um, you know, integrity and honesty can go hand in hand. So can openness. Now, I understand that there are parts of your job that are classified. There are parts of what you are um, what you are seeing, what you are doing in a job can't be known to the public. I get that. That's fine. But at the same time, it is one of those things I just wish people would understand about public officials. They can't always tell us everything that there is to do this. Now, this is the opening letter to the Prime Minister. Pri Dear Prime Minister, I'm pleased to present you the 17th report of the Committee of Standards in Public Life on Intimidation in Public Life. You invited the committee to undertake a review of the intimidation of parliamentary candidates in July 2017. Considering the wider implications for public office holders and producing recommendations for actions which could be taken in the short and long term, the committee wishes to thank all those who gave evidence to the review, particularly those who are willing to relate often highly personal and distressing experiences of intimidation. It is vi the vitality of our political culture depends upon free and vigorous expression of opinion, and it is crucial that this freedom is preserved. The increasing prevalence of intimidation of parliamentary candidates and others in public life should concern everyone who cares about our democracy. This is not about defending elitists, elites from justified criticism or preventing public from scrutinizing those who represent them. It's about defending the fundamental structures of political freedom. It... it yeah. <laughs> you, what, what you're veiling here, what, what this... What this paragraph veils to me or tries to veil from me is that while we're not defending the elites from justified criticism we we still need to defend the fundamental structures of political freedom and it's and it is 
not so much that they're they they're trying to defend the fundamental structures they're trying to defend the status quo they are trying to defend those that that are in office as those who are are not able to defend themselves without getting more backlash um, you know i if i were to make if i were a politician and i made a stand on a, on an issue and i get attacked <laughs> again air quotes here attacked on twitter or whatever for my policy and i defend myself and i get more attacks that's to be expected that's you know if you if you were backing something as a politician you better be sure you want to back it especially if you're going to be on social media um a significant portion of the candidates in 2017's general election experienced harassment, abuse, and intimidation. There has been persistent, vile, shocking abuse, threatened violence, including sexual violence, not okay, damage to prop- and damage to property, it's, again, not okay. It's clear that much of this behavior is targeted at certain groups. The widespread use of social media platforms is the most significant factor driving the behavior we are seeing. Intimidatory behavior is already af- affecting the way M- in which MPs are relating to their constituents, has put off candidates who want to serve their communities from standing for public office, and threatens to damage the vibrancy and diversity of our public life. However, the committee believes that our political culture can be protected from further damage if action is taken now. Having taken evidence from n- a number of parliamentary candidates and a range of expert organizations, and members of the public, it is clear that there is no single easy solution. But at a watershed moment in our political history, it is time for a new and concert, concerted response. And our, our report makes recommendations which address the full breadth of the problem we face. Those across the public life must work together to address this problem. We must see greater energy in action from social media companies political parties, parliament, police, broadcast and print media, and from MPs and parliamentary candidates themselves. Above all, this is a question of leadership by our largest political parties. This is all the more important in light of recent allegations of sexual harassment and bullying in parliament, which will have shaken public confidence in politicians. Political parties will need to work together to address intimidation in public life, and they should not use this report and its recommendations for partisan purposes or political gain. We propose legislative changes that the government should bring forward on social media companies, liability for illegal content online, and an electoral offense for intimidating parliamentary candidates and party campaigners. Political parties must also put in place measures for more effective joint working to combat intimidation in advance of the next general election. In the long term, prevention will be more effective and important than any individual sanction. Those in public life must adopt a more healthy public discourse and must stand together to oppose behavior which threatens the integrity of public life. I recommend... I commend the report to you, signed Lord Bew, Chair, Committee, Standards of Public Life. And you can see here what they're trying to propose is social media companies, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all of them, would have a liability for what you, the user, post. And you'll have some liability too. But at the same time, I don't, I don't think that that's how it's going to work is they might end up just making the social media companies liable, which means they're going to start blocking more and more of what we post politically, whether justified or not, it will be, it will be a decision that the Congress, that the parliament makes. I can understand the, the electoral offense uh, you know, having a, a punishment for that by uh, by bringing towards the people. So if you are convicted 
Oh, something, and I, I think it has to be something serious, not just, hey, I don't like your views, you're, you know, bloody twat or whatever. That's not abuse. That's not harassment. That's just somebody who's expressing their opinion, and yes, it is in a vulgar way. But that's not harassment. Come on, grow up, get a thicker skin. It also has to be one of those situations where it can't be something like a lifetime ban. I, I don't want to see something like a, a lifetime ban on that. But at the same time, as a country that purports to have a, a semblance of freedom of speech, with the ability to speak how you want, the UK is starting to get more and more into governing what you can and cannot say. Even even jokes taken out of context can be used against people. Even if, you know, you say something not intending to be insensitive or rude, as soon as somebody takes offense of it, it can it can cause the person who tweeted or posted that to be in trouble. The law could even find the the they actually have police forces that are designed to scroll through social media and find things that are offensive, harassment, etc. So I just I just think that we should as a society I think that we as a society need to look that yes, the internet allows us a much broader freedom of finding information, finding things that we both like and dislike. But we also have to take the personal responsibility that if we find something offensive to either A, call it out, not call for sanctions against people, but call it out be like, hey, I think this, and let our inner group of friends know. I don't, I found this video, I don't think you, I think it's horrible, blah, blah, blah. Write a letter to, you know, YouTube. Write an email to YouTube, What, whatever. Solve things at the lowest level possible. That's what I was always taught when I was in the Navy. If you have a beef with somebody or if you have an issue, solve it with the person face to face. If you can't do that, that's when you get the leading petty officers involved. And if they don't resolve it, then you go to the chiefs, etc., so on up the chain of command. Same thing here. If you disagree with somebody, disagree with them, and then just move on. Don't continue Twitter flame wars, etc., like that. The online drama is what feeds the trolls. So just don't engage in it. Just make your brief statement, move on. That's my advice to the to the MPs. Take it for what you will. Uh, lastly, I honestly think that if this if some proposal like this passes, the citizens of the UK are going to be hurt far more for anything that could impact social media companies than it would be if it were if it were to be on the onus of the person themselves. And I'm not saying that the laws that they currently have are okay in the UK. I think they need to be revamped and, and, and pulled back, scaled back just a little bit. Because the age old adage is offense is taken, not given. Meaning that you can only take offense at something because people don't generally give offense. I mean, there are times where you, you know people will go out of their way, again, online trolls, to say something offensive and mean the offense in, in that sense. But if you're just standing next to somebody and you hear you overhear the conversation and you get offended by what they're saying, doesn't mean that they were intending to give offense to you. They're probably not even they're probably oblivious to the fact that you're even there. You know, I don't know. It's just, it's just one of those things. I think, honestly, we have to, as a worldwide society, think about how we're policing the internet and think about how we're policing people in general on their quote-unquote thought crimes, on their quote-unquote speech. You know, either you have, either you have freedom of speech or you don't. Either you have freedom of speech, the freedom to express your views, whether how vile or hated they are by others. 
or you have censorship. And that's one. That's my take on it. You can tell me I'm wrong if you want. I was only meaning this to be a few minutes long, you know, like 10, 15 minutes. But it's just such a irate thing, you know, and how I, how I wanted to do this. But thank you for watching the initial thoughts by Jay video here. Hope you enjoyed it. Give me some feedback. Give me, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Positive feedback, negative feedback. I'll take, I'll take it all. I don't care. I just wish you, I just wish and hope that you guys that are in the UK that will talk to your MPs and let them know that you're not okay with this. That they are going to basically make it illegal for you to criticize them on social media whatsoever. That's kind of what this news report is making it sound like. Is not only can you not criticize them, you cannot run for office after that if you're convicted. Words hurt sometimes, yes. But they're not entirely meant as a weapon in that way. Words are not always meant to... Words are not always meant to be harmful. If I provide honest criticism and you take offense at it, that's on you, not on me. So that's where we'll end this today. Have a wonderful week. And enjoy, enjoy the rest of your summer if you're on summer vacation.